can, any of you that are logged on, it was actually quite impressive. There's a lot of people that had logged on. There are a bunch of questions that are on there that you can take a look. Please vote. And what will end up happening is some of those, if you want to put it through, they'll go through an anonymous. And the ones that get the highest votes uh, will be asked. The other thing is, this is usually the part where we like interaction. So folks that are up here have volunteered to be of use, so please feel free to use them. But this is the part most people look at. So we have uh, Matt Davis uh, at the end here. We have Jennifer Brown, Scott Heishka, um, Corinne Talbot, and Francis uh, Laurent, Saint Laurent. So with that, we will open up for any questions right off the bat. If not, we'll check over. Any questions? Uh, Marsha will be going around with the microphone. I'm over you. here. One right in front of you. Question? Yeah, a uh, question um, probably for, uh, for Matt. Uh, we didn't really talk a lot about uh, free access stalls, but I noticed that you have some arms that have been converted to free access stalls. What's your experience of performance out of a free access stall? Because it strikes me that they perform a little bit more like a dry sow stall, um, which we all have a lot of familiarity with. What's your feeling about that? I, can you hear it's all in the details, folks. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would I would agree completely that the free access stalls are, are performance is very good, very similar to what we're all used to. Uh, our our concern with it is uh, is the cost because of the square footage that's required, and when you start looking at at if it's a retrofit, the amount of spaces that you give up, or if you're building new construction. Just the what we call the concrete cost that you incur to get that required square footage for that system. But performance-wise, yeah, very, very well, very good. We're right at ten. Uh, there's, um, I, I think it was thirteen, fourteen was recommended, and as a typical producer, we said we don't want to spend that much money and let's do ten. And I don't think you'd want to go any less than that. But in some of the spaces, uh, pens, we also have a, a tea area at the end of the solid flooring. And uh, yeah, the, the management is so simple with that system. Uh, but yeah, it's more expensive. And, and then people do complain. Uh, our nutritionist says, well, that's not really group housing since most of the time they are in, in, the, in the stalls. And we've tried to study it. And yeah, it's, it's the bigger sows that come out more so than the smaller sows. Okay, any other questions? I saw a hand up somewhere here. <laughs> this may be a bit unfair, but I was wondering if I could ask the panel if they could, on their loose cell housing, whether it's just stall or ESF or whatever, they could tell me if it's fully slatted or partially slatted. And then if you associate and then the proportion of cells that are laying or percentage of lameness. I'm, I'm wondering if there's a correlation between whether you're fully slatted or partially slatted and lameness problems. Well, <clears throat> well, I'm fully slatted because I don't want to go with uh, with full floor because it's another space to compete for. In my mind, I just want to make it equal for everyone and no compete, no uh, more competition space. And I can't compare everything we have right now is par partially slatted. We are building a brand new one fully slatted, so in a year from now I'll be able to see, but right now it's all partially. And lameness, pretty, pretty. Yeah, I'll show you some number. I tried to put it in percentage now of our sow mortality. Um, it would be around at uh, probably 50% of the sow that are euthanized are due to lameness. Um. Ours is partially slotted as well, um, and percent of lameness would be up in that 50% of euthanized as well. Um, yeah. First, one of your swine we have uh, partially slatted pens largely, uh, but the slats are actually, uh, they were cow slats that we put in, uh, so very wide gap. Uh, 
don't see a lot of lameness again because there's so little aggression in those pens. So I don't have to take it. So ours, ours would be, uh, all of our uh, pen gestation would be fully slatted. And so um, I, would, I would think, I would think though that when you look at number of sounds euthanized or death loss as, as far as uh, sound death loss, it, it'd probably be pretty similar to what everybody else has said. Um, you know, you know, with the fully slatted on all of the different types that we have. Scott, can you just speak to how you built that gap, that main manure gap in those slots? What was your trick there that you figured out? Um, with that, we we didn't want to give up the entire slot gap, so uh, we put a form up, uh, laid uh, 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 roofing. Uh, paper over top of the slot gap and and then poured a, a grout uh, over it and then to get it to bond we had to jackhammer to get a fresh aggregate um, and then finish it up so it, it was a bit of a process but it's it's held up and not broken up so far any other questions so i'm going to jump in with one from the computer here um, is there a way to predict the low totem pole sows? Um, and if so, um, can we put all of those sows together in one group and what would happen? Yeah. <laughs> That's a very interesting question. And I, I do recall there has been research on it. Um, uh, but, but largely social status depends on the group you're in. Certainly, yeah, there are some individuals that will re repeatedly show up in the low end of, of the social status. Uh, but um, I, I can't really recall, recall totally what, what, what they found, but, but, but basically you put them in a group, and again, your social, social dynamic is gonna develop within that group. There will become high and low ranking members within that group, and then you've still got all your dominants, which are now obviously together in that group, and I, and I don't think that that's gonna be a very, very good sit situation, especially for the dominants. All, all being grouped together. I think uh, diversity, I mean, if you talk to an HR kind of person, such as your wife's got there, uh, <laughs> diversity, we, we, should, we should value that because it keeps us all from, uh, uh, you know, destroying each other. If we were all the same, it wouldn't be a very, very happy world. So, the same goes for South. I would, I would agree with that completely, that I don't, I don't think that we've not found any way to identify those. I will say that on our, uh, on our shoulder stall barns or pens of 10, uh, we have we have found though that if we spend a little bit of extra time when those pens are made, and we don't just go down the down the breeding row and take the next 10 in row, but we actually take and invest a little bit of time and group those um, by body condition, that has that has helped our fall out in those pens of 10 tremendously, and uh, we've gotten that very very low, and uh, where it used to be a problem. And, uh, and so that is something that we've learned. We still can't, we can't go down and predict which one may fall out, but we, we think we can minimize the number of fallouts uh, within the barn. Any questions? Um, I actually have a, a question that was, uh, we were chatting about at the back, and probably this is for the whole panel. Um, as we move forward into you know, what's coming ahead of us and the industry moves, with those of you that have experience, what do you see as the gaps or the areas that we as an industry need to put further resources or come up with creative solutions for? And it's sort of an open question, but I think those are ones where we're looking and different people we were chatting have different theories, but for you that have been at it, what do you see as the, the pitfalls or the areas that we need to put some research or effort into? Maybe I can start, and I think I mentioned in my presentation, I think on the sow mortality in general, and, and not saying it's in low housing alone, I know the U.S. have put some task force together, like Veterinary and working on trying to decrease sow mortality in general, and now in low housing, it's easy for us to blame it on the lateness. It's, wow, well, my mortality went up, it's because I went to low housing and I'm more late. That's not a solution, and we just need to, so I think that would be in the future something we can work toward as an industry, just for both production systems, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree with the, the longevity one. Um, also, uh, flooring, so studies on flooring, and I, I think the University of Manitoba is going to be doing some more work on that. Um, like alternative flooring types, uh, and, and then the, we've got the slap and gap, but uh, 
uh, the textures, uh, rubber matting. Uh, but then another area that the certain poultry producers have gone into is lighting. And there's very little research on lighting in swan production, and, and uh, uh, we should definitely know some more about it. Right. 
for the best of animals anyway. So we will let them neutral. Yeah, like the other says, more guild selection. Um, with whose housing we have, um, I think probably more nose nose contact between sows and the little before, and probably a little more uh, fecal oral exposure. So my question for the panel is: Are you seeing any diseases, uh, you know, specific diseases that we maybe used to have under control in in gestation stalls that are not quite so under control now that you've made the transition? Thinking about just ordinary stuff like erysipelas or ileitis or even like roundworms or anything like that. Maybe I'll start that off, Greg, and I'll uh, refer to my vet. And what, what, what would he have to say about that, Greg? <laughs> I, I think that's, a, that's actually a great question. And I'll be honest, I really haven't thought about it, but just sitting here in 20 seconds, I, I can't say that we have. Uh, you would think that you would, um, but yeah, I, I, can't, I can't think of any instances that we've seen a, seen a difference in that dynamic. It'll be the same for us. We haven't seen any difference in health challenge uh, going to New South Yeah. For us, we've seen a little more the array, bigger, because the unity of the guild is not uh, as strong as the old New South, and they are the same pair. So we have a little more the the array in the, for the guild in the P1. But I think Europeans that I've worked with would say that that's a benefit because the, the young sounds are developing immunity yeah, by being exposed to whatever's in their environment. So when you reform, like, you get 35 gil in a group of 120. It's not a benefit right now. Maybe <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> Just on that one, I think we'd have a few producers in here that would, would comment at least on the roundworms, which is what Greg was getting to, where they have seen more roundworms at a pre ferro treatment that the sows will drop more uh, than they would before. And I think on the fecal oral transmission, when they were in stalls, that transmission wasn't there for picking up eggs. Not across the board, but probably if you ask some of them when they're going for a pre ferro treatment, they will see more coming out. Any other questions? So I can uh, ask another one from the computer here. Um, have you noticed if the degree of relatedness of the animals influences aggression? So if they're um, the more closely related those sows are, uh, are they less aggressive towards each other? I guess that comes back to me on the research side, and yeah, Harold Gagne and Joe Stuckey in Saskatchewan actually did a study because. In, in wildlife, it's also been studied uh, with the evolutionary hypothesis that if you're closely related, that you're going to be uh, nicer to uh, individuals that are more closely related. Uh, but, but definitely, uh, so there was some evidence of that in wild animals. So they, so they did an actual study with pigs. Was it just uh, familiarity? So they did some cross-fostering uh, to see whether it was familiarity or relatedness that, uh, that produced aggression. And it was it was more the, the familiarity and the relatedness that we didn't seem to factor in at all. We have another one. Greg has another question. Kevin. Go figure. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a lot to learn, so thank you. <laughs> Do any of you have experience um, with purebreds and F1s in uh, in group housing? And do you have any advice for producers here who may have a herd that has a, an internal nucleus, anything specially you need to do with those purebreds? <coughs> we did convert one over the summer, uh, so we have actually GPs uh, and pure in that herd, and uh, no different than commercial herd, I guess. It, it's very really similar. So maybe you want you were meaning like uh, for aggressivity or yeah, or, or the, the two different media types interacting if they have to be in the same tent. Yeah, so it's still very new for us. It's just they've been converting over the summer, um, so it's pretty hard to see. But as of now, it didn't do anything uh, different in commercial. Um, but we do have a, an, e, uh, an ESF barn in, in Saskatchewan. It's a Hutterite barn. 
And they're saying every time they put the purebreds in the pen, they're the focal focus of, of way more aggression. He said if, if we had it to do over again, he'd make a separate pen for the purebreds. Yeah, Jeff, what's the question? Okay, any other burning questions? If not, I think probably where we're going to. Are there any on? That one. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so I'll ask one more off of here. Um, so for each of you, what do you see as the next big thing with the, the ESFs and the free access stall systems? Uh, is it going to be something like weighing sows, body fat measurements? What's sort of the next step in the technology progression? I think if my guys from the farm were here, it would be vaccinating sows as they come through to eat because that becomes, a, for anybody that's gone into a pen of 80 sows to vaccinate, that becomes a, a challenge, becomes a little bit of a safety risk also. And so if, if our safety guy was here, he would, I think he would back that up. Uh, so that's something that, you know, that we've discussed and I, I know there's some, I think there's some people working on that, but I'm not aware of any that is, that, that are out there available commercially yet, but I think that would be a big a big step forward, um, and actually less stress on the animals because I mean, as we know, I mean today we typically vaccinate, we drop feed, we go vaccinate, and most sows don't pay attention; they're eating. If we could do that in the ESFs, I think that would you know there'd be a lot of advantages to that. More, there's going to be way more work on the nutrition side for phase feeding now that we have that capacity with the ESF feeders. Uh, so a lot of interest in the phase feeding. Um, one of the new colony barns just put in the, the NEDAP ESF with the waste scale in it. And so getting all those records uh, daily. And then there will be visual recognition methods that also can uh, estimate the body weights. So, so yeah, there'll, there'll be some interesting new technologies, but uh, certainly a lot of interest in the nutritional side of things. Yeah, I agree with uh, with those two comments too. It's it's gonna sky's the limit, I think, with technology. I mean, look how far it's gone the last five years. I think another interesting one is uh, the camera that can uh, um, measure the movement of the cells and detect if she's lame or not. So maybe that's also that would be uh, useful to detect early lameness. Yeah, maybe I'm dreaming, but uh, maybe we'll have pregnancy pregnancy testing under the station to, uh, to test the cells and the system will tell us which one will work or get no no baby. I'm just wondering um, for these electronic feed stations, if you if you have a power outage or I don't know, power surges, how much it screws up your systems? If you lose a lot of time, if you find that sounds are not getting fed when you're supposed to be because of some sort of glitch in the system being the power outage. Has that been an issue? Yeah. We've put some surge projects on the building, of course, and there's not a lot of power fear, but of course there is. Technology comes bug and everything. Everyone's here. I had a cell phone that bug one time, so technology was a little bit bug, I think. But you have to pass through it. And if you're the owner, you will fix it quite quickly. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. We've we've somewhat learned the hard way on the ESFs that what you would call normal, like lightning protection, you want like times ten. Because um, as I mentioned earlier, that if you don't have that system to feed your sows, um, how do you feed 1,200 sows tomorrow morning? And so we've we've gone to a lot higher degree of that backup generators on everything, um, and then also alarm systems tied into the feed systems, so that um, you mentioned in your presentation that at 1 a.m. if it calls you, you better get there and get them feed because if you wait till six, seven o'clock when the team gets there you behind, and, and I think it was Sylvan that said four hour delay puts you behind five days. That's that's just about spot on. And also you need computer spare, of course. 
Thunder's very real. So where is the, is the just have to the old wire and reconnect the, the other computer if she goes there and get another one straight right there. The only thing you do is the stick and say all the all the data and so it's the two and you ready to I've got a, just a quick question, I guess, Scott, you, want to, you won't have to answer this one. Ear tags, did not hear a lot of complaints today about ear tags. Um, you satisfied with the ones that we have now and the reliability and the stability, or is it something that we have to look at to, because we lose the ear tag, we can possibly lose the sow, and then nothing, nothing works that way. I think overall, it's not a huge issue, but it's one of those where it, it's a it's a daily daily issue uh, on a very low number, um, but it's it's I look at it as part of that. The one thing that got me thinking when the question about what's coming in the future, so you know our our, our phones now have retina and face display. Or do we ever get there with with that type of technology and eliminate tags completely? Um, don't know, but I don't think ten years ago we would have thought we'd have it on cell phones. So. Maybe there's, you know, there, there's an opportunity there. It is something that it, you're going to deal with with ESF. You're going to deal with lost tags. I finding them, identifying them, retagging them, changing that, and putting the computer. It's a reality. Um, sorry, the big progress. Many of you get the big progress updates. Anyway, uh, China. There's a Chinese group, and they are doing facial recognition of the South. Eventually, and apparently right now it can't can't follow from uh, you know the first parity through. But once they reach that uh, follow their, their their first gestation, then you know, the faces I mean, they can follow that cell the rest of their life. So uh, it's coming. Yeah. Yeah, like said, losing tags and being across for me, what's most diff difficult is to take out the, the, all the transporter to all the south. When you see the south, she gets like five holes in the ear. She's looking at you and she knows what you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> and for that, it's more difficult, I think. And uh, like I said, I change transporter between 7 to 20 more transporter per week. So it became a regular task. And for the employees, also, because has an eight with a tag and the first one is hard but one by day you learn fast. Okay I think there's uh, one last question that's come in and then uh, the speakers or some of them will be around and then there's social hour so we'll have this question if there's anything else you can cut us after. Um, okay, so this one was actually written specifically for Matt, but I think we'll maybe open it up if anyone else wants to comment as well. Um, so you have multiple different systems in your organization right now. Um, have you decided on one system moving forward um, into the future? So uh, the question is depend. It depends. <laughs> love that. Love that answer, right? Um, I think it really depends on whether you're talking uh, a, a retrofit into an existing facility or a brand new facility. Um, brand new facility, I, I will say that we, we probably are going to gonna shade towards the pins of 10 because of the simplicity factor. Um, we also, um, you know, I've mentioned or I've heard feed mentioned quite a bit today. Uh, we, we, we live in a, in a lower cost feed area than, than what you guys face and so that's a reality. Uh, it's you know so that's that's part of what drives it if you know if our feed costs were substantially higher that answer may be a little bit different but um, I think as far as retrofits again I think everything that we've used does work um, and so I think I think on those on those uh, situations or those projects it, I think all, all the all the options out there are very viable and, and work work very well um, so that that would be I think where we stand today on that on that question I guess if you're looking for opinions, I think with the new build, I would go with the uh, Samsung electronic sow feeding with the static, static pins. Um, I think somebody else preferred that as well today. 
Um, I was asked a question earlier. I didn't really have the answer, but uh, I mean, you, you you get good at one thing and, and you stick with it. I mean, our, our fans were learning uh, with competitive feeding and it, it, it's a workable system, but we we're just talking about all the new technologies and uh, I guess you, you evaluate what's available that day and, and make the choice. Yeah, I would say that uh, in 2014, when we go with ESF uh, from Big Dutchman, we went totally different from Craig. And if you ask me tomorrow, you'll do the same. Yes, I'll do the same. But if you ask me tomorrow, you have another <coughs> one to do. And I would say maybe I'll go a little bit closer to the Craig uh, because of the performance and also, uh, or maybe if I found the right arm to run uh, the ESF as well as I do. Uh, there will be no problem with ESF, but it's kind of, we have to have the right people, the good people that can drive it easily. And uh, if there's someone in the, in the room, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can talk. <laughs> We got mainly ESF, but like I said, in 2008, we did convert the cell barn to just the shoulder stalls, and, and both system works. And like you mentioned, it depends what your needs are, on how much money you want to invest, and what you're what you're looking for in the future. We decided to go with ESF long term. It's just uh, uh, answer our needs better. All those new technology coming are interesting. Hopefully, we can adopt some of those, and ESF was just a better fit. So. Okay. Any last questions? With that, uh, we'll thank our speakers, and then we'll go for some closing remarks. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.